now being recorded. Um, my name is John Haber. I'm the Field Services Director for the California Preservation Foundation. We wanted to thank you for joining the ninth webinar of 2014 entitled Economic Development 3, Preservation Planning in Post-Redevelopment California. We encourage you to become a member of CPF and enjoy the benefits and educational discounts. Information on membership can be found at our website, which is at californiapreservation.org. The California Preservation Foundation is a member-based, not-for-profit organization whose mission is to provide statewide leadership in education and advocacy to ensure protection of historic resources in California. The format for today's webinar will consist of three individual mini-presentations, approximately 25 minutes each. We will close with a 15-minute question and answer period. There is a Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen. If you have a question at any, at any time during the presentation, please type it in the box, and we will hold the question until it can be addressed by a speaker. There is also a chat box right above the Q&A box. This chat box is visible to all participants. If you would like to comment, interject, or even ask a question, you may do so through the chat box. If you're attached to a microphone, you should grant Adobe Connect voice access for your microphone. Your voice will be muted during most of the presentation, but you may raise your hand uh, by clicking on the hand symbol at the top of your screen, which is in the center portion on the top. Once your hand is raised, we will grant you voice access at an appropriate time in the presentation. This will allow you to have a short dialogue with the speakers or ask a question in person. If for some reason your sound does not work, you will need to type in your question or response in the chat box. I'm now, uh, I'm now going to introduce each of our speakers. Cassandra Walker led the award-winning award redevelopment efforts in downtown Napa for 16 years as the Community Development Director. Recently, as an MRG consultant, she has worked with the cities of Lincoln, Vallejo, and Hercules to implement economic development programs and wind down former redevelopment activities. Her experience also includes public-private projects for the University of California, Irvine, and economic development programs in Arizona. Since joining RSG in 2005, Alexis Middle has led communities through project policy changes and initiatives that influence economic development efforts, from long-term strategies to neighborhood market studies. Ms. Middle's work includes economic growth strategy, strategies with e expertise in fiscal management, modeling, and solutions for municipal finance. Her favorite endeavors are projects that include clients with insight on funding options and local economic growth opportunities that best fit their community. Ms. Middle maintains close ties to the UCI Urban and Regional Planning Master Program, working with individual students on thesis projects as well as delivering local government 101 lectures to classes. She also recently served on the technical advisory panel for the Urban Land Institute's Young Leaders Group in Orange County, which provided a local nonprofit with a how-to guide on searching for, for and selecting properties that better meet the needs of the children it serves. Laura Cole Roll is the owner of Laura Cole Roll Consulting, based out of Sassoon uh, City, California. Laura, Laura specializes in organizational development of nonprofit and downtown organizations and currently serves as the executive director of the California Main Street Alliance, as well as assisting downtown and Main Street organizations and other nonprofit foundations. She served as the executive director of the Davis Downtown Business Association, then the Main Street community from 1997 to 2007, and has worked as an executive director and a consultant for cities and downtown associa associations since 1988. She received the designation of certified Main Street Manager through the National Main Street Center in Washington, D.C. in 2004. So without further ado, I'm now going to begin the presentation with Cassandra Walker. Thank you. Um, I appreciate everyone being on this webinar today and learning a little bit about more about preservation planning and post-redevelopment in California. As John indicated, I have quite um, some lengthy experience in redevelopment and now post-redevelopment. And just wanted to share some of the, the tools that we've been using, and hopefully you will get some ideas from that. I 
don't know the background of everyone that's on the conference call, but from the participant list, it looks like we have a number of cities. So excuse me if this is a little redundant for you. But in the political realm, we have the city council, who in many cases was named as the successor agency to the redevelopment agency. And there was a mandatory creation of an oversight board that is made up of city representatives, county representatives, school districts, um, and the largest special district in that particular county. And they now have jurisdiction over um, sort of guiding post-redevelopment in conjunction with the successor agency. The successor agency operates it on a day-to-day -day basis and goes to the oversight board for approval of different activities. I know in most communities you'll have a planning commission, and in many you will have a design review board. And um, some have certified local governments that are act as a historic preservation commission. These really make up, you know, the entity associated with the city that helps guide planning and development in a community. Um, the preservation groups play a really important role along with the, um, any business districts you have, Main Street programs. Sort of all of these entities work together to help promote um, a community. Some of the implementation tools I'm going to go over today, um, we call legal sticks and economic carrots, um, mandatory um, documents that are put into place that require developers and, and planners to work with to guide the future of the community. And in some, in some entities, there's some newer carrots coming on for there's some existing um, grants and in place that some folks can use. So I'll go over those really quickly and then talk a little bit about the economic development uh, approach working with different groups. Um, I kind of went over a lot of this already, so I'm going to skip this slide in my initial introduction. The legal tools that are in place are preservation ordinance. That outlines the structure of how cities implement preservation in a community. It might have design guidelines. It might set certain standards. Um, it will outline how demolition takes place. Um, it will set out the goals for a particular preservation activities. The Historic Building Code, as many of you may know, talks about historic structures and special standards that can be applied to the renovation and rehabilitation of those structures. Many communities are now really starting to do historic surveys and, entity and inventories. These are really important documents if you're going to facilitate the preservation of historic buildings. Um, if you don't have them on some kind of list or inventory, it gets more difficult now to ensure their long-term preservation. Um, these inventories and lists you know, also have national, state, and local registered properties listed on them. Um, the inventories can be done by district within a community. It can be an overall city inventory. Um, it can be inventories that are related to the different ages of structure. So there's different ways that you can set them up based on your community needs. As many of you know, historic resources reports document specific properties, um, outline any preservation that's going to work that needs to take place, identify special features, those kind of things. Um, when a property is being looked at for preservation and comes before a city, one of the sticks that can be applied that are conditions of approval and development requirements. And this comes into play in post um, redevelopment actions when they're related to um, the long range property management plan that must be developed. And I'll go into that in a minute. But the conditions of approval and development requires requirements set out specific conditions to which a developer must meet in the rehabilitation of a property or the development of a project. 
CEQA. Um, I think everyone knows a little bit about CEQA and the, categorical, the limits on the categorical, categorical exemptions that can be used for historic resource projects. Um, the next thing, I intended to put a slide in here about long-range property management plans, but I somehow missed that, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit now. A long-range property management plan is the document that successor agencies are required to develop that lists all of the properties that was, were formerly owned by the redevelopment agency. And these properties have to be divided into different categories properties that are going to be retained for future development by the successor agency with the approval of the oversight board, properties that are going to be put up for sale, and properties that are going to be retained because they are government use or for a government um, purpose, like a park or a parking structure or a library, a city hall building. Now these inventories or long-range property management plan really provide a lot of detailed information about each parcel, um, the size, when it was purchased, what it was intended to be used for, what it can be used for now, what its value is, any current um, leases that are associated with the property, any environmental contamination. So each successor agency has to prepare these, and the oversight boards have to approve them, as well as the Department of Finance. And many properties, historic properties that are owned by communities or were owned by successor agencies will appear on these lists. So if um, your preservation work may lead you to want to know what's happening in terms of these lists, in terms of these long-range property management plans right now. Um, that's one source of information about former successor agency or redevelopment agency property. So going on to carrots, there's not very many in our toolbox right now. Um, some communities have facade and seismic grants available. Some are using their PDBG money to fund those. Others may have some um, former redevelopment agency bond funds they can use for those. But um, those funds seem to be drying up a bit. Other programs are MILVEC that reduce the property tax on a particular historic structure. Several communities are using these. I've known many that are using them for more commercial buildings, but some are starting to use them on historic residential properties. Some communities are starting to put in place revocable loans. Um, they'll fund loans on a property for certain work, and then over a period of time, the loan is forgiven. There's been some new legislation um, and pending legislation. One pending legislation is the new Economic Development and State Historic Tax Credit Act bill. And some new legislation that's now in place is the infrastructure financing districts to help fund capital improvements. And I think Alexis is going to go into these in more detail. I'm just providing more of the overview. Other speakers will get into more detail. Um, there are several aspects of how you might approach economic development in post-redevelopment. I'll go over those quickly. I'll talk about some of the benefits of preservation, um, who, what the preservation groups can do acting as early advocates, how you might want to consider working with developers and property owners, and how preservation um, projects you can get an early look at through the long-range property management plan process. And just start thinking about educating um, the public and whose responsibility that is um, to keep them on board and knowing um, what you might be planning for in the future in terms of your community. You know, I think some of these are fairly obvious. You know, preservation certainly stimulates economies. It's probably proven. Certainly, um, Laura can talk about it as part of the Main Street program. Um, the rehabilitation of buildings in a certain district really acts as a catalyst for additional investment. So even a small start, even if you can begin by doing some facade changes, getting new tenants into buildings, um, making, uh, providing tours, of historic structures really start 
ensuring the visibility of um, buildings and in that way you can often find investors that want to help um, preserve them and start um, building start um, we'll start looking at how um, small preservation projects can start building um, into a catalyst for further change. Um, it also certainly encourages property maintenance and additional rehabilitation in neighborhoods. The first project sort of leads and others quickly follow. People begin to feel secure about investing in a community where they see positive change. Um, in Napa and in other communities, I've certainly worked the historic downtown and other historic districts often generated the highest property values. And I think investors felt secure about going into areas where their investment was like-minded people and they could see the change. Um, certainly, restored areas become a regional and local draw or destination. Um, there's more and more um, activities taking place in downtowns, particularly through Main Street programs and promotions and other um, business district promotion and events. They become sort of the heart of the community. And it just really instills community pride when the historic structures start being preserved. So for preservation groups, and I don't know how many of those are with us, um, you really can be an early advocate and you can be a watchdog. If you're a partner with the city, you can certainly lend your expertise in identifying key properties, assisting with the development of inventories. Um, if you see something happening in, in a neighborhood that the city might not be aware of, calling an alert to that. It's really helpful when the preservation organizations can be sort of um, a partner with the city in ensuring the preservation of projects and being an advocate for them. It's good to know your preservation ordinance. What does it say? What are the particular procedures for reviewing renovations or demolitions? What are the requirements? And really understanding the real world, real world impl impl implications you know, of a preservation project and what is uh, financially feasible and what do the guidelines and ordinances require. Um, being aware if your city has a current historic inventory, providing whatever you, assistance you can in documenting structures. And if you're a member of a preservation group, educating the public through workshops and tours, seminars, special preservation day activities, um, all of those get the community more invested in what you're doing. Working with developers and property owners. So we've talked a little bit about the long-range property management plan and outlining the properties to be sold and what they're trying to accomplish through the sale of those properties. So when successor agencies do sell a property, they're going to set up certain um, conditions and standards um, through a development agreement or other type of agreement to ensure a project um, is sold and completed the way that the city intended. Um, if it's a preservation-related project, it would be great if the preservation advocates to work early on with the city to understand what their goals are um, in historic properties that are identified on the long-range property management plan. Um, always working with the developer early to understand what his concepts for a project are. Sometimes they want to keep it close to the vest because they don't want anyone to oppose them. But understanding what the key properties are in your community and what your particular vision or concepts are for those and being in a, in a lead role and being able to articulate your ideas is very important. Educating the public. Um, this is one thing that I think both cities and preservation organizations could do a little better job at. We so, get so involved in our day-to-day -day activities, we forget that 
you know, we need to make sure the public is involved with and understand what's going on. Cities generally can do this through certain types of preservation workshops or when they have study sessions um, on different topics, um, particularly when they're updating their ordinances or they're undertaking surveys or inventories, we tend to do more outreach. Um, Certainly, the cities, when they're financially feasible, should be doing providing support for seismic and the facade renovations. Um, and they can also support by having a local mills act. Preservation groups, we talked about a little bit, can do more um, tours, have walking tours, identify key buildings, talking about different historic structures in, in your local newspaper and articles. Um, coming up with speakers that can talk on anything from how to replace windows to, you know, uh, key um, citizens in the history of a community and how they relate to key properties. Having design awards for people that do excellent jobs on renovation or having properties identified on a most endangered list. So my goal today is to bring everyone up to speed so that our other speakers can go into more detail. And I think that's it for me. Uh, thank you very much, Cassandra. Um, right now, what you'll see at the top of your screen is a poll. So we're asking everybody to um, answer uh, the question um, as best they see. And I just realized that this is a poll for the next question, which isn't so bad. But um, go ahead and answer this one, and we'll go into it during Alexa's um, presentation. Uh, right now, everybody should be seeing the results. So feel free to answer uh, what you think is the most single important financial incentive for your preservation program right now. OK, so it looks like most people are answering the Mills Act. Um, which sort of, it actually surprises me, but maybe Alexa can talk more about it. And I'm sure um, some of these may come up um, in, in the next session. So I'm going to close this poll. And begin the next presentation. And um, one second, Alexa, I'm going to unmute you. All right, you're ready. Great, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. One of the things I was asked to talk a little bit about was some recent trending regarding historical preservation. And, and this information is actually kind of difficult to come by. There's not much of a, um, a comprehensive database that incorporates all the different methods that are used, and understandably, because there are so many different options that are out there. None of them easy, but um, certainly they do exist. This is um, one of the ones I found. It's from National Park Service. And it shows trending over the last uh, wow, 30 years or so. And you can see a dip in the early 90s there. And that has to do with some changes in tax law. But since then, there has been a market increase, and with a you know, slight exception there for the recession, we have continued to trend upward. And I think this graph really speaks to the idea that historic preservation is on trend. And potentially, there is some momentum going, as you see with that uptick there. But it's also fair to say it may not necessarily be momentum so much as preservation and, and development in general is so expensive now that there is diminished private capability of doing this work um, on the private sector alone. And therefore, there's more interest in capitalizing on the public dollars that are available. Certainly, I think we could say that's true in California with the loss of redevelopment. I thought this graph was um, also from the National Park Service was pretty important because it shows how big a role housing is playing in rehab projects and historic preservation projects uh, kind of hovering around that 50% mark, give or take. And housing is critical to economic development, especially affordable housing, especially here in California. It gets to the state goals of meeting the regional needs housing allocation, the RENA requirements. It also speaks 
to the idea that infill is critical to our success because these preservation projects are you know, typically in more centralized and older areas where there's greater access um, from a pedestrian scale, also potentially from a transit scale, depending on the area. It speaks to the SB 375 goals that the legislature established. And I think it really um, is key to getting to the larger benefits that, that Cass was describing in communication to the public and to the city audiences of how historic preservation really meets all of these other other goals. These are self-reported, so they're not going to be um, perfect statistics, but it is still telling a little bit of a story there about the importance of housing and jobs and how historic preservation is accomplishing these, these goals. And these, again, are self-reported, but I thought it was pretty interesting that California is um, in the nation second highest of all the states that, that are using these qualified expenditures um, that the National Park Service offers through the tax, uh, tax incentive program. I pulled a couple neighbors there. You see Arizona and Oregon, Texas coming nowhere close to what California spent in 2013. Um, the larger states are there, uh, starting with Virginia on its way down, showing the other um, relative expenditures in the year. So traditional tools. These are available. They've always been available. Um, some cities undertook them. A lot of cities relied on their redevelopment agency for these things. But without redevelopment, we are really back to looking at some of these these items that can take place in our communities now without any change in legislation, without any change from the state level. It's just a matter of changing the mind on the community level and um, with the local city council or board of supervisors. Because preservation has a lot of value added. Uh, as Cass did a great job of giving an overview of how it saves history. There's um, beautiful buildings. It really engages us kind of on an emotional level. But it is a lot of work, and city councils aren't necessarily known for approving projects just because they're kind of cool. So what we want to do is engage the city council in all these other discussions of, about the importance of preservation and how it ties to all those different goals, the 375 goals, local goals. And um, you know, things like major rehab isn't necessarily going to save any money over a new build, but it certainly gets the ancillary benefits of, of the feel good and the real benefits of having improved infill development, local affordable housing. So an underwriting strategy is, is one way that you can do that at a policy level, at a city level, whether or not historic preservation is at the core of the city goals. And this is not right for every city. But if it's right for yours, it's something that could be written into a policy document. Same with a revolving loan program. These aren't particularly common, certainly not for um, general fund in the state of things today in California. But there are a couple of them out there. Again, they really are um, a good revolving loan program has a priority um, funding mechanism. So there's a way at which projects are judged. And if historic preservation is important to the community, it needs to be high on that, on that list. Infrastructure outlay, there are different partners for that. Infrastructure um, is incredibly expensive, but Caltrans, different utilities, uh, power companies will often come into alignment and, and try to make those projects true. And a land acquisition program, again, pretty rare without an RDA, but, but some cities will do it. And some cities are, um, we work with several right now that are preparing to do that more in the future just because they understand there is a benefit from, from a land acquisition program that will come back to the general fund. Traditional city tools, uh, permitting, again, if you have historic properties, uh, is there an expertise on staff to help private investors make these parameters easier? Is there faster? Is there incentive? Um, how far up the food chain does, does something need to go in order to get approval? There are ways to take advantage of different exemptions for infill development, um, depending on how you adopted your sequel for your general plan. Sometimes that frees up um, a little bit of flexibility. And uh, as I stated, rehab and preservation is, is truly on trend if it's useful. And this really aligns with the federal programs that, that require rehab projects to be income producing. And it's, it's a much easier sell to a city council if you can say that, and this is not only feel good, but 
we're using public investment dollars for for a good project that's going to be a benefit to the entire city. And John, my whole system just went down. Oh, there it is. Okay. Oh. Is your screen showing right now? It is showing, but it's not letting me flip the slide. Oh, do you want me to move to the next one? Let me try. Okay, if I did the arrows, okay, now it's working. Okay. Um, traditional economic developer tools is just talking and really getting out in the neighborhood, understanding who is looking to invest, who's looking for space, particularly in um, you know historic districts or or in certain certain areas of the city that have a, a specific feel to them and who, who wants a really neat space. And whether the uh, infrastructure is in place is something good to know. One of, one of the you know, things we sometimes forget to do as economic developers is talk to the other entities of the city that may have a better feel for who's coming into areas. Maybe it's the building um, permits, maybe it's someone in public works that has a little bit um, better finger on the pulse of the type of businesses and operation needs that are coming into a certain area, and whether or not there's anything that can be done to kind of streamline those needs to make things a little bit easier. Some of the other financing tools that are out there, we've heard a lot about infrastructure finance districts, particularly this last six months or so. They've been available for a long time, since 1990, I think is when the original legislation was adopted. They are extremely cumbersome. Uh, they've only been used twice in, in California, and probably a lot of that had to do with the fact that we did have redevelopment, which was a less cumbersome process. At the moment, to put in an infrastructure finance district requires two-thirds vote of the residents to form the district and to issue debt. So you kind of have to take it twice. An infrastructure financing district can issue debt to, at this point, to things that are related specifically to infrastructure and there needs to be compliance or a nexus that states this project has a community-wide significance. It works like redevelopment did where it's a, an inf, um, a tax increment structure where there's a base year established and assessed value generated on top of that base year can be used to finance these infrastructure items. Schools are not included and for a lot of our communities that half of the property tax share is going to schools. So it really leaves a lot less um, playroom, so to speak, in terms of being able to finance a, a long-term bond. The governor has proposed changes to IFDs as part of the 1415 budget. A portion of that proposal was adopted um, in 471, which was approved in February of this year. It allows the overlap of infrastructure finance districts and redevelopment project areas. I would say for most communities that really didn't make a whole lot of difference. The other thing the governor is interested in proposing as part of this project is that it would create a little more flexibility in the types of projects that could be financed by IFDs, which kind of speaks to this quality of life investment with affordable housing and infill development with direct ties to historic preservation and upholding the goals of SE 375. You still have a lot of the same requirements under current IFDs, except he has proposed to lower the voter approval to 55%. This may be problematic. Um, the legislative uh, office has come, legislative analyst office has come out with a written discussion on this as to whether or not that's constitutional, and they at this point don't think that it is. They've suggested a couple other ways it might be structured. So 55% um, sounds nice, but it might not actually stand the test of, of legality in a constitutional battle. Community development financial institutions, these have also been in place for quite a while, something we don't use particularly well yet in California. Other states use them um, much more effectively. There are uh, 90 in the state of California. They're all over the state. Um, certain banks can be the CDFI, you could be a community development corporation. There's a number of different entities that can form a CDFI. They can provide tax credit incentives for different kinds of projects. 
and each CDFI has their own set of goals on what they want to fund. Um, here in Orange County, there is an emphasis on affordable housing in particular. Um, actually, that's probably true of Southern California in general. So if you have a project that isn't, um, isn't lining up with the CDFI you're approaching, it's not going to work. So there will be some due diligence on, on the front end to find a CDFI that may have goals similar to the type of project you're attempting to do. So to find someone that's in alignment with historic preservation or whether or not you can go back and draw those ties between the historic preservation project and the creation or maintenance of affordable housing or some other nexus that would interest that CDFI in becoming a funding partner for a project. The Organized Investment Network is actually a little bit of a um, kind of a tag along to CDFIs. So this legislation, maybe 32, it basically took additional money and will fun funnel it into the CDFI tax credit program. So it was, if you know how to use CDFIs and work with those, this creates an additional benefit. There's more money available for projects to be financed through a CDFI. This um, AB 32 specifically prioritizes affordable housing as well as veterans. Industrial development bonds. Um, I know one community that, that has been looking at these because historic preservation has manufacturing involved in it too. A lot, uh, a lot of big old warehouses around the state. The um, the process for these is actually relatively flexible. Um, the community itself can be the issuer, or iBank will be the issuer if the local government does not wish to participate in the process. Um, the borrower does need to be a manufacturing company. You can request from $1 million up to $10 million. Historically, California has not used this funding mechanism, has not used it particularly well. Every year there's funding available, and not all of it is taken. So if you do have a manufacturing company that's interested in you know, taking over an old warehouse, doing some rehab, that type of thing, this would line up very well. And contract assessment districts, these are kind of fun. They aren't widely used um, either. Relatively new legislation under AB 811, this is the PACE legislation, and this allows for um, financing related to um, different kinds of environmental benefits. So for solar panel installation or water conservation, it's not directly related to historic preservation, but it could be used as a little bit of a, um, a layered financing mechanism or something that, as we discussed earlier, might help incentivize businesses coming back into a historic district and providing that, that private investment that's needed. So what you can do with, with this type of a district it can be on a parcel by parcel basis. Not everyone needs to participate. You can have some people who opt in and some people opt out. Obviously, you need you want to have you know a, some semblance of a group to make it worthwhile going through the process. But they would fund things like individual solar panels on a roof of a multifamily property or or something like that that would therefore benefit that property ultimately by reduced power bills and supporting the SB 375 measures and, and state priorities but it's nice because it doesn't have to be everyone that agrees to it. It's, it's something that could just be a component to incentivize development or to add on to the benefits of being in a historic district. And the final tool I'm going to talk about today are the business improvement districts. We do have a number of these around the state. There are a couple of different ways to form them. They can be um, put into a district where there's an assessment on the business or on the property owner. It's used to fund specific items in the district that are of benefit to that business or that property owner. The, the key with business improvement districts is making sure that the goals align because a city is a service provider and a business wants to make money and those two don't necessarily equate to um, being on the same playing field. There's a, there's a fundamental difference there. So there is a lot of upfront work that needs to go into business improvement districts to make sure that when that ordinance goes to the city council,
that everyone can be behind it and understand what benefit they're going to get out of it and make sure that it's a benefit the businesses want and not something that the city is trying to take in its own direction. I'm going to show you um, a little bit about downtown Santa Ana, where we do have a business improvement district. This is uh, part of our downtown. This is looking down 4th Street. And you can see we have a number of historic buildings here. This is one of the oldest parts of Orange County. You can see uh, kind of in the lower left there, all those dresses in the window. That's one of our many quinceanera slash wedding shops that are in downtown. Also, to the right of the photo there, you see Bank of America. I've been working in downtown for about 10 years now. And when I started down here 10 years ago, we had Citibank and one other local bank that were here. And now we have all the major players. We've got the U of A. We've got Wells Fargo. We've um, got a number of other investments, uh, investment institutions. This was a redevelopment project area. There was significant investment put in probably about 20 years ago by the RDA. And one of the really key parts of their strategy at the time was they worked with Cal State Fullerton and they attracted uh, a portion of their art department to come into downtown and open up kind of an artist studio. There's a display center. There's some lofts. And that was really the first catalyst piece. And since then, there's been a, quite a bit of a ramp up time with less and less redevelopment um, financing over the years and more and more of the businesses themselves taking on, taking on their own life. We did have a business improvement district down here for a number of years. The um, assessments were collected and uh, given to a nonprofit. Uh, the nonprofit managed the money and, and managed the investments. There, there were different um, initiatives that were undertaken, including additional um, patrol for safety measures, beautification, trash pickup, all, kind of your the typical things you would see. And, and truthfully, it really did pay off. It, it, they sound very um, mundane when you talk about having a little extra trash pickup, but it truly did turn the downtown around over the last 20 years. And now we've become quite the place. We have a booming restaurant life, um, a nightlife, a number of new shops. The, uh, the shop there, in the three-story building on the right, the bottom floor is a barber shop. We have a couple of these. They're kind of you know, styled as an old school barber shop. And the line is out the door by 9.30 in the morning to come get your hair cut at this place. We also see the integration of, um, of different cultures. We were primarily a Latino area for a number of years. And now with the reinvestment in the downtown, we see um, a lot more integration of different cultures, of different age groups, a lot more um, younger people coming into the downtown than used to be, including our, our hipster population. This is a new mural there up there to the left. And it's on the edge of a building that's being renovated right now, actually. It's going to be a little bit of an indoor marketplace, a la um, kind of the ferry building in San Francisco or Oxbow Market in Napa, but with its own downtown Santa Ana twist. This is the old city hall. And that was renovated. It has a private tenant now. City Hall has relocated a number of years ago. And you can see off to the right, there's an integration of condos that were developed into the downtown. This is kind of our, our poster child for how uh, the city and the business improvement district wound up kind of coming head to head a few years ago. So the, the photo there that's in the top left is an older picture of what was called Fiesta Plaza. And this is privately owned, privately operated. There are a number of businesses on both sides of a large open plaza. And in the 80s, the plaza was envisioned as a kind of a Latino culture center. There were some outdoor marketplace activities. Uh, it was decorated in a kind of a festival theme. And that existed for, for many, many years. And then probably about seven years ago, started rotating businesses much faster than, than had been. And the private property owner decided that this concept had lived past its time, and it was time to do something different. So he went ahead and did a renovation project himself, he, the family that, that owns this 
plaza and the neighboring buildings. And you can see the results there in those other two pictures. Uh, the one on the bottom left there was towards the end of construction. And then the one on the right, the larger one, is taken a few days ago. So this is what the plaza looks like today. There are several of the businesses um, that were able to hold on. Some of the smaller ones you can't really see. There's a little pizza place and um, a little Catholic bookstore. Those have been there for quite some time. But all the other businesses have experienced a lot of turnover and were really kind of stabilized. Um, the business that's in there immediately to the right of the picture is called the Playground. It's um, certainly one of our most innovative restaurants downtown. If you want to go there on a Friday or Saturday night, you need to plan two months in advance to get a reservation. It's, it's just truly taken off. And this redevelopment, or the redevelopment of this, which was not funded by the redevelopment agency, was really the impetus for the marketplace that's actually going in across the street that I showed the earlier picture of. So it's attracted quite a bit of private investment into the downtown. The contentious part really had to do with the conversion of the plaza from a Latino focus to what you would call, I, I don't know, I just suppose a more modern focus. And we saw this in our business improvement district as well, where there really developed uh, a series of feelings that the nonprofit was truly channeling all these business improvement funds to the nightlife, to restaurants, to bars, and they had forgotten about the rest of downtown and the rest of the businesses, many of which are still very Latino oriented. And it really came to a head. At one point, we didn't have a business improvement district. There were competing proposals from different nonprofits to reinstate the business improvement district and how that money was going to be channeled to help businesses. And then a, another nonprofit would say, well, we really need to be about the nightlife. All our money should go to the nightlife. And we had to, it was a very confusing time here in downtown Santa Ana. But Ultimately, they ended up splitting the baby in half. We do have a business improvement district, and the revenues are split between two nonprofits for management and for um, investment. And one of the nonprofits is more restaurants, nightlife oriented, and the other nonprofit um, proposes to kind of speak for everyone else, if you will. This is our building, uh, the building I'm calling you from. We're there, um, kind of the center picture there, Rosemary Sapsa Group, you can see in the window. We're actually three stories. It's a little bit hard to tell. The, um, the structure itself is three separate structures, and we share a common facade. So as you look down the structure there, we have neighbors next to us. They are, at any point, um, have five to 10 different businesses in that space. It's definitely an informal incubator, if you will. Started with um, a couple of friends, and pretty soon they had all their acquaintances in. It's a rotating business model. One week it'll be a shoe store because somebody they know needs a place to sell shoes for a week, and then it'll switch to something else. Um, you can walk by, and they've got pinball machines, and you know they're in there at 11 o'clock at night, and, and all that good stuff. But it, it really does speak to the not only the changing model of downtown, but the changing model of um, a use of space, particularly in an urban area where you are attracting um, new users, different users, younger users, millennials, and, and Gen Ys that just have um, a very different set of expectations for how they want to play out their career. And we're realizing the benefits here um, in our own building. This is the bottom floor of the building I'm in. Uh, RSG is on the top floor. The bottom floor, we've taken our co-tenant. It's going to be a brewery. Uh, you can see some of the tanks there. They're in the process of putting in um, the additional sewer infrastructure that's needed in order to process the massive volume of wastewater that, that's involved in a brewery. I dropped this slide in just because I think it's important to, to speak to historic preservation being an economic development model that attracts investment. And when you're looking at older areas and you're talking about businesses, you're, you're looking at businesses that are truly struggling to figure out how to survive or even how to start. And the overwhelming majority of our businesses um, in the nation, but certainly in California, are small businesses. One to four employees make up the vast majority of, of our businesses here. And how do you speak to those groups? How do you speak to the millennials? How do you speak to startup companies? How do you speak to the you know, the groups that are in the five to nine range and looking to expand, how can you bring them into a downtown or a historic preservation zone and have that become a part of their business model and, and a part of their investment interests? 
And the best option um, I've recently heard for that anyway came out of Santa Rosa. I had the opportunity to hear them talk about this project uh, a couple months ago at the Caled conference. And they have decided to attract breweries into downtown Santa Rosa, Santa Rosa in particular, but also into downtown. And they have done some pretty interesting things in order to make that happen because as opposed to just going out and marketing to breweries about how great downtown is, what they did is they went in and figured out what breweries really need was a way to process their wastewater, as I mentioned earlier. It takes um, three to seven barrels of water to make one barrel of beer. So there's quite a bit of output. So what Santa Rosa worked in partnership with um, with their water treatment plant as uh, a way to attract these users by making it much easier for them to process their wastewater. They have these huge anaerobic digesters which can take the, the wastewater and, and the waste in general out of a brewery and transform it into useful energy that actually is used to power the wastewater treatment plant. And it's something that they have used as a sales point. And they now have a number of breweries in downtown Santa Rosa. And what they've done is been able to take that and incentivize this um, fostering of businesses because they have this other opportunity. So it's a little bit about getting outside the box, not necessarily um, the way you would think about it, doing it in a linear fashion, but kind of coming at it from, from another angle. It makes it easier for you to figure out if you have a target audience that you're looking for, thinking about what they need in order to make that business successful is another way that you can draw investment in because of um, both Cass and I have talked about. There's there's no silver bullet here. It's always going to be a matter of layering the financing such that it ultimately works. It's kind of one step at a time and piece it together to make it to make. It. John, I think that's it for me. Uh, great. Thank you very much, Alexa. And if anybody has any questions, you're more than welcome to ask now. Um, we will have 15 minutes of Q and A uh, time. Um, in fact, I'm going to pull up a uh, poll. Um, um, this is a uh, sorry, wrong poll. And we're asking people if they're a Main Street community, and it actually, I, I think it's it's surprising that there's two people um, in the room that are, or three now. Um, and uh, Laura will will speak to that. Um, it, I, I think. Um, wow. Okay. So uh, six uh, six answered no. Um, four answered yes. Um, and I'm going to end the poll right now because that looks like most people have answered. Um, uh, unmute, Laura. And Laura, yep. you're ready to go. I am. Thank you very much. Um, well, I know two of the communities that are here. I can see Vallejo and Hanford are here. So I'm curious who the other ones are. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about today about the Main Street four-point approach. Um, over the past 30 years, the Main Street movement has transformed the way communities think about the revitalization and management of their downtowns and neighborhood commercial districts. Cities and towns across the nation have come to see that a prosperous, sustainable community is only as healthy as its core. And I happen to be in Detroit right now at the National Main Street Conference. And it's very exciting to be here with about 1,500 other people who practice the approach and speakers and all the states that are here and all the communities that are representative. But no matter what the name of your Main Street is, it could be Fifth Avenue, Main Street, Martin Luther King Boulevard, what that represents is really universal. You know, Main Street is the economic engine, the big stage, and the core of the community. Our Main Streets tell us who we are and who we were and how the past has shaped us. We don't go to bland suburbs or enclosed shopping malls to learn about the past, explore our culture, or discover our our identity. Our main streets are the places of shared memory where people still come together to live, work, and play. 
the phrase Main Street is really mainstream right now. It's been used to describe everything from our nostalgic past to our current economic woes. But when we talk about Main Street, we are thinking of real places doing real work to revitalize our economies and preserve our characters of our communities. Uh, specifically, Main Street is three things, a proven strategy for revitalization, a powerful network of linked communities, and a national support program that leads the field. It's basically economic development with a historic preservation ethic. We use what is called the Main Street Four-Point Approach, and it's a neat, unique preservation-based economic development tool that enables communities to revitalize downtown and neighborhood business districts by leveraging local assets from historic, historic cultural and architectural resources to local enterprises and community pride. It's a comprehensive strategy that addresses a variety of issues and problems that challenge traditional commercial districts. And there is a lot of talk, and it's really kind of exciting to be here because everything is universal. There isn't one thing that somebody has done in their core that hasn't happened to somebody else, and that what really makes Main Street unique. Um, since its founding in 1980, the National Main Street Center has been the leader of a coast-to-coast -coast network of communities and cities who use the Main Street approach to rebuild the places and enterprises that create sustainable, vibrant communities. Over the past 30 years, the Main Street Center has overseen the development of a network of coordinating programs that include 37 states, four citywide programs, and one regional program, which happens to be Oakland County, which is right next year to Detroit. These coordinating programs uh, help cities, cities, towns, villages revitalize their downtown and their neighborhood business districts. Coordinating program staff such as myself help build the capacity of local Main Street programs, expand the network of the communities, provide resource and technical assistance, and work with the National Main Street Center to explore new solutions to the revitalization challenges and respond to emerging trends throughout the nation. Reinvestment in uh, Main Street communities has spurred almost, this is slides old because we got new figures the other day, uh, $55.7 in reinvestment in traditional commercial districts, almost 110,000 new businesses, more than 236,000 building rehabs, and just have energized and galvanized thousands of volunteers and changed the way governments, planners, and developers view historic preservation. In addition to the four-point approach, we also have mythology that incorporates guiding principles for success successful organizational revitalization. And you can see on the screen that it's comprehensive, incremental. It's not going to happen overnight, folks. It's, it's a long-range process. And as we were told the other day, we are never done. More importantly, it's self-help. Nobody else is doing it for you. It takes a community group with partnerships such as city economic development, corporations, building owners, property owners, business owners. You identify and capitalize on what you already have in your commercial district or your downtown. Things that we do is not going to be shoddy. We want things that are of quality, not quantity. Change is really important. Sometimes people in towns resist change. Um, but that's what it's all about. And also, it's not about doing all these plans and then letting them sit on the shelf. It's about implementing those plans. A little bit about California Main Street. We were founded in 1985. Currently, we have 27 communities that have been designated by the state that's completed requirements to become a designated Main Street community. We have six communities now that aspire to become designated. The program is now housed with state historic 
uh, State Office of Historic Preservation, OHP contracts with the California Ministry of Alliance for services such as training and serves as a resource for the program. Originally, it was in California Trade and Commerce Department, which was um, eliminated in the early 2000s. For today's discussion, I'm not going to talk about all four points. I'm going to highlight only two of them that are relative to our subject today, which is design and economic restructuring. The design point of the four-point approach encompasses educating both property and business owners on historic preservation. And a lot of things, what um, Cass said earlier, it's understanding your local preservation ordinances historic building codes, how to use your inventories and surveys, and what the national, state, and local registers mean, as well as historic resources reports and CEQA. Some mainstream communities provide preservation architects or have a list of resources for architectural assistance for historic properties. Main Street approach design committees help facilitate and make suggestions for anything that is visual in downtown, including uh, pedestrian amenities, facade improvements, and lighting. With the elimination of redevelopment, many cities look for ways to continue economic development efforts in their downtowns. Add to that staff cuts due to the recession. Using the Main Street approach now can help it fill in items that city staff may have been assigned to in the past but don't have the capacity right now in doing. Excuse me, including business recruitment and retention, educational opportunities to strengthen existing businesses, new uses for traditional or historic downtown buildings that are vacant by working with property owners, developing or finding financial incentives, and monitoring economic development performance in downtown through such things as sales tax reports. Main Street really is a self-help program. It helps stakeholders understand the vital role that a healthy downtown plays in the community by contributing to economic development through all points of the Main Street approach. It helps serve residents with places to shop and dine and provides a place to attend community events. And I really like this quote by the um, mayor of Americus, Georgia. Um, I think it's really relevant. Um, that sometimes you just have to do it yourself and get everybody together to do it. So the thing with Main Street is that um, one organization can't do this by themselves. So Main Street encourages participation from many coalitions and partnerships with other organizations to help with its work for its revitalization efforts. And that is anything from economic development to historic preservation to promotion of events and marketing in downtown. This is a chart for um, the organizational structure of a typical Main Street program. You can see what each four-point approach committee is in charge of and how the board and employee structure works in Main Street. So you see we're focusing on design and economic restructuring today, so public spaces, building improvements, education and enforcement for design and then for economic restructuring, market research, business assistance, financial assistance, and property development. I get to talk a little bit about pending and new legislation in California, and both Alexa and Cass touched upon it. You are all are probably aware of AB 1999, which is still in committee as of today. It's re refer to the Appropriations Committee, which we'll meet tomorrow. But basically, um, the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Incentive Program, currently available, of course, to California's income-producing historic properties, has generated nearly $1.5 billion in investments during the last 10 years. While 35 states have similar tax credits or incentives for historic preservation, there is no such incentive in California. States that have partnered a state incentive with the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Incentive have reaped significant economic development benefits, including construction and building industry job creation, 
increase state tax revenues through increased employment and wages, increased local property tax revenues through increased property values, and increased local tax revenues through sales tax and heritage tourism. So over the last 10 years, California has 129 projects qualify the federal for the federal tax Preser historic preservation tax incentive program. These projects have been located in 20 different counties. And as California communities continue to adjust and adapt to the dissolution of redevelopment agencies, proven tools are still needed to incentivize economic development and revitalize economically distressed areas. So we're very hopeful so far. It does go to um, back to appropriations tomorrow. I believe Jonathan has some links that you can read the language of the bill if you already have them. And um, Alexa touched upon AB um, 471, which is the uh, successor agencies to redevelopment agencies, which was signed by the governor and the infrastructure financing district. So I'm not to explain that really probably better than I can, and I'm of a voice left. Um, that's pretty much it for the presentation. We're only trying to take an hour, but we do at California Main Street Alliance provide technical assistance to California's historic commercial districts and traditional neighborhoods and downtown, and our expertise helps communities set forth a vision of your revitalization efforts with support from local government and property owners and business owners and, of course, citizens. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. I'm, I'm pulling up a final poll for everybody right before we get into the Q&A session. And while everybody is taking this poll, um, uh, please feel more than free to fill in the chat box or ask your question in the Q&A box. Um, I currently don't see any questions, but you may do so now. We're going to go into a 15-minute Q&A period. Um, and people are already answering uh, the question. And it appears that uh, most people see uh, business owners as the most important partners in a Main Street revitalization program. Um, coming in second is homeowners and local arts organizations. Um, and. Uh, close third or now a second is financial uh, I'm sorry preservation groups um, so but uh, it appears that most people choose the business owners um, and while we're waiting for questions I was wondering um, if I could throw one out there just to get things rolling and again if anybody has a question just either raise your hand or type in the chat box um, but I, I wanted to see what um, particularly Alexa, because she described it in most detail. But I wanted to see what she thought or how, how to um, manage the, uh, the, the often um, challenging um, uh, when, when an infrastructure project comes in um, to a community, it often uh, clashes with preservation. Um, and I'm wondering how one could wed the two. And the reason I'm sort of re referring to this is I'm in the window here, and people will see um, one of my screens. I'm pulling up um, the uh, Fulton Mall in Fresno. Some of you may be familiar with this. Um, but Alexa, I was wondering uh, if, and, and in the case of Fulton, um, it has to do with a TIGER grant, a Department of Transportation grant, um, that uh, challenges a, um, a historic landscape, really a plaza. And when you were talking about plazas, um, I immediately thought of this project. And I'm hoping people can see my screen right now. But um, uh, the reason uh, this comes up as an interesting side note is that um, this modern, you know, very modern landscape um, uh, is proposed to be realigned to be a, a vehicular um, landscape, I guess you would say. And so in this case, and I'm showing, I'm pulling up an image of uh, option number two. Um, so uh, in this case, it may seem that um, infrastructure projects clash with preservation. But I'm wondering if you can think of any examples or, or strategies for making the two work together. 
Oh, and I'm sorry, I need to unmute you first, so um, let me unmute you here. There we go. I, 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 there's no perfect answer to that, and I would say all three of us have, you know, have brought up the idea of, you know, being in partnership with your community. There's certainly on the business side of things and, and the plaza that I looked at in, in my slides, I mean, that, that's a private business owner and they want to make money. They want their, um, their buildings to succeed, which means they need tenants. So when you're looking you know, at strictly a private model, I think a lot of that really comes down to conversation and you know, trying to work with the property owner as much as possible. When you're looking at government, Investment, I think that's a little bit of a different realm. So, um, you know, the, the Tiger Grant, Fulton Mall, um, those type of things. At the end of the day, I don't know how you would ultimately come out with a project that didn't involve um, a decent amount of, of community outreach trying to figure out where, where a middle ground is. Because if, if, you, if you're so tied that you can't make these businesses work, you know, you haven't won. You haven't won anything. So I think some of it is really just kind of a give and take model that needs to be found with the unique community to where, you know, some of the preservation, you know, is able to come in and take place. But at the same time, there still has to be that that private sector piece of it to where, you know, someone owns that land and they probably want to make some money off of it. Great, thank you um, for your answer. And I, uh, I don't see any questions at this moment. Um, uh, I will still wait a few seconds here to see if I see any coming in. Um, and at the same time, if anybody on the phone would like to ask uh, their question without having to type, I could always easily unmute you. Or you can unmute yourself. Uh, all you have to do is press star, uh, star six. Um, and this is actually the first time there have been no questions. So um, I wanted to thank each of the speakers for their time because apparently they did it so well that nobody has any questions. Um, but uh, at this moment, I'm going to move um, into the evaluation uh, section of the presentation. Um, and this is where California Preservation Foundation learns from you and uh, hopefully improves our programs based on your responses. Um, you also will notice a box with a period of related, uh, a series of related links on the top of the page. Um, there's links to the California Main Street Alliance, um, Alexis Firm, um, Municipal Resource Group, but there's also links to um, the State Rehab Tax Credit, um, AB 1999, um, and California Preservation has posted a number of resources online um, that des describes that in in relatively short format. Um, you can also take advantage of our upcoming webinars and workshops. Um, our next series is actually another series. It's on CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. And um, if you'd like to take advantage of the same discount that you received for the Economic Development Series, um, that uh, deal is still in effect. So 25% off all course fees uh, by registering for the full series. Um, the first webinar on, in the CEQA series will be happening on, on the 10th of June um, from noon to uh, 1.30 on Tuesday. And we also have two workshops next week at Stanford. Um, the first day would be a full day of California of the CEQA, and um, second day would be uh, Secretary of Interior Standards. Um, so as you're responding to this poll, I just wanted to make everybody aware, and I, I say this every time, but the submit button is at the top of the page. So if you please respond um, uh, for each of the multiple choice responses, and then scroll back up to the top of the page, there's a submit button in the middle of the response, and you have to hit that before we receive your, your response. Um, and on the right-hand side, that's where we really learn what you would like to see. Um, we use this information for our following year's programs, and um, hopefully something that you suggest would appear on the education calendar next year. So. Thanks again, everybody, for your time. We're about to end a little early today. Um, but if anybody still has questions, um, 
this is the last call, and uh, you would do so by pressing star six on your phone. Um, but it appears there are no questions, and I'm going to leave this screen up here for people to provide their responses and visit the link. But I wanted to thank Alexa, Laura, and Cass, Cassandra um, Walker, uh, for their time today, and, and really appreciate um, your uh, presentations. Each of them uh, was apparently so good that nobody had any questions. So uh, have a great day. It's a beautiful day outside. And um, enjoy the rest of the day.